Welcome everybody to Grapple University, Unit 1, The Foundations of Guard, Part 1, Distance Management. You'll have the option of hitting the mute button as we'll have written text as well if you need to watch in silence. If you recall, one of the first principles from Guard is that you are losing, so distance management is your number one priority. The Shell Guard is something Ryan Hall first introduced in his Defensive Guard DVD. It's basically an open guard where both the legs and arms have the potential to act as load-bearing frames or exert muscular force. In a perfect world, the ends of both sets of limbs, for example, the bottoms of our feet or the various orientations of our hands, have the potential to either push and or pull. We call this the full shell. I also mentioned in the beginning, there are three types of extreme passers, each with clear pros and cons. We will identify these extremes as the following archetypes to help describe your countermeasures and strategies from guard. The kneeler, the runner, and the wrestler. We will begin with an opponent on their knees driving forward since it's the simplest place to start. The kneeler is less susceptible to leg locks so long as they avoid being elevated. They have great base backwards if paired with live toes. And perhaps most appealing, it requires less leg dexterity and movement, meaning you can conserve energy. Wink. Nevertheless, the kneeler has vulnerable posture and arm structure as they are easier to reach. They have drastically reduced mobility and comically weak base if unable to match changing angles of attack. Grappling is, of course, a dynamic sport, and we often move from archetype to archetype in a real-life scenario. But this is to deal with that stalling person who just, you know, sits there and doesn't want to play. According to one of the best instructors in the world, Paul Schreiner, in a purely defensive state, a push-push configuration is best. Keeping the legs coiled with potential energy but still acting as frames gives the guard player future access to a leg press, which is a very powerful movement. Also, reserving the ability to lock your arms out and align the bones in the strongest frames possible, which are called stiff arms, can act as potential placeholders should your opponent initially get past your legs. And you can see Rob Bernacki for more on that. In this very simple example, the opponent on top is driving forward and the person on the bottom is resisting and managing the distance using the stiff arms and the coiled leg press position, acting as strong frames. And don't worry, things will get a little bit more exciting as we move on. If you recall, our second principle is to simply get up. Against a straight driving force, you have the option of leg pressing them away. Try to keep contact with your stiff arm by building up into base on your elbow and placing the other leg in base on the ground. Maintain a placeholder with a stiff leg on the hip as you angle out as best as possible to deflect the driving force offline. Aim for 45 degrees, but be willing to accept less. The heel of the hand works great against a direct straight force, but the webbing between your index and thumb or V grip makes for better tracking during dynamic angle changes and versus pliable body parts. In other words, aim for the junction of the neck as opposed to the shoulder. Get to your knees as quickly as possible with toes engaged or live toes using a sprawling motion. You then have the option of capturing the head or simply executing a technical standup. Please note that this is not a simple movement. It requires proper timing. You will see in the next section that there is actually an easier way to set this up. Some common mistakes are spazzing out and kicking your legs beyond the reach of your arms, which breaks your elbow knee connection. Also failing to build a proper base with your rear arm and therefore not being able to absorb the force of your opponent driving in. This can also occur if you make no attempt to angle out or rush standing up, which leaves you open to an ankle pick. Getting up is not easy, especially under duress. So let's add a little bit more to our distance management toolkit to give the top player more to think about. Sometimes you have to actually approach this in a counterintuitive manner and stay more connected to your opponent to hide your true intentions. Against an opponent driving forward and then trying to force a better angle of attack, it is often necessary to both push and pull. The structure of arms become weaker when you open them away from the core. And once again, we have to tip our hat to Ryan Hall for the open elbow concept. Double triceps control is a very simple way to manage your opponent if they try to control above your knees while in the shell guard. Similar to an elbow tie, Pull the back of their triceps into the pointy part of your shin bone, or the tibial tuberosity, and then flare your shins out into the biceps insertion. This opens the elbow and should not be comfortable to your partner. If your opponent starts to force an angle of attack, use this attachment to shift with them and recenter. The half leg press is an excellent way to make space to either sit up so you can maintain control or drag them back down with you. It is a half press. 
Do not fully lock out your legs or you risk having them thrown by should you lose upper body control. The half press is excellent at masking your true intentions, like getting up. Me getting kicked away that far, by the way, is not an exaggeration. He is simply a horse. Wait, never mind. Collar ties directly affect posture by pulling on the neck or shoving the crown of the head downwards should you begin to lose control of the arms due to sweat, fatigue, or just being slow. The key is to stay connected at all times with the potential to either push and or pull. Targeting base posture and structure interchangeably creates opportunities to maintain control and keep your opponent at bay. Grappling is very goal oriented so staying connected may utilize very different tools depending on your purpose. Your goal might be to isolate an arm or to be in a position to block punches, or both. You may not want to have your head grabbed or get punched in the face, or both. These are two more important movements for your toolkit. Pummeling is basically a jockeying for inside control. We mostly think of pummeling in terms of our arms, particularly when engaged in a standing battle. But while on our backs, our legs can likewise engage in this positional contest. Sometimes you will have to engage in a battle where you pull the arm to the inside in order to reinsert your shin and flare your leg out once again to reclaim the inside space. If you lose connection with your opponent's arms, it is necessary to lift your hips up or bridge, engaging your butt and making your legs heavy so it is difficult to just grab your ankles and toss your legs aside. According to multiple time Roosterweight World Champion Kai Otera, learning to raise your hips high is vital to success against stronger and aggressive opponents. One of the major mistakes from guard is losing connection with the opponent. Like, what do I do with my hands? I see many grapplers frequently just stop doing anything with their arms. Or they do the opposite and just arbitrarily spaz out pulling people, often into guard passes. We will talk about the preferred types of grips to establish in the near future. A common mistake, however, is often settling for simple one versus one grips at the wrong times. In addition, we have the reoccurring problems of sagging hips making the legs light, disengaged feet, eliminating the leg press option, and failing to keep the shins flared, resulting in folding tight passes. Both arms on the inside always offers a strong push-push defensive option. However, this doesn't necessarily translate into better control. Trapping one of your opponent's arms inside while tracking the other can limit their offensive potential and offers paths for your own countermeasures. Most players on top are taught to either have both arms in or both arms out when inside another player's guard. However, a one arm in, one arm out scenario can be dangerous to both players. There's a fine line between a guard attack and giving up a pass. The in and out is a strong position within the shell guard. While in control of the triceps of one arm, slide down to the elbow and open it up as you do a half leg press. As you sit up on an angle, quickly slip your leg past with pressure, squeezing with both legs to trap your opponent. Trap the elbow with the heel of your hand right above the elbow and pressuring upwards to hyperextend the arm. Try to trap the lower forearm of your opponent in your armpit before returning to the ground on a slight angle. Your other arm can then slide down to control the wrists or grab a collar tie. The in and out position offers greater control of your opponent and thus opens up a full range of hip mobility to call upon if the feet remain engaged in base on the opponent's hips. As already demonstrated, the player can bridge their hips up, they can press their opponent or themselves away to sit up, and they can now pivot side to side. This full range of motion allows the guard player to maintain connection while restricting the mobility of the passer, so long as your thighs remain squeezed. Some common mistakes from the in and out position include not pinching your legs together, leaving your outside leg vulnerable to being pinned for a guard pass. Electing to use a heavy overhook instead of the heel of the hand above the elbow on the in arm can limit the ability to bail and frame if your leg does get bypassed and can be a gateway to your opponent's underhook should you fail to squeeze your legs in the first place. Needless to say, losing entire control of the other arm or posture gives opportunities for the top player to now free their trapped arm and counterattack. The half press and the pivot are two distinct tools that can either be used separately or together. The key is understanding the purpose of each and being consciously aware of how you intend to use them. On its own, the half press creates space, while a pivot produces a new angle and a potential angle of attack. You can press and pivot at the same time to create space and a new angle. This is called a hip escape or shrimp, which is a term I really hate. 
Although a hip escape is important, it often produces a poor angle of attack and is best used defensively to reestablish or recover the shell guard. We will discuss this more in Unit 2. As previously demonstrated, a half press can be used to move yourself or your opponent away to make space or provide opportunities to regain control. Sitting up halfway off a press is a great way for a guard player to explore potential weaknesses in the top player's alignment, while not fully committing to a purely defensive or counteroffensive decision. Using the in and out as an example, you can use the half press to disrupt your opponent's base and fake like you're about to sit up, only to drag them back down. Since their arm is already trapped, this action could very well compromise their alignment further. If you successfully manage to break their posture as well from this action, you may now be in a position to explore two common attacks, the triangle choke and the omoplata, which is a shoulder lock. We care less about the finishing details of either at this point, but more so on the concepts used to break posture and weaken the structure of the arm, as well as the pivoting movement to create the proper angle of attack. There are many resources out there if you're keen to learn more about the finish. If we successfully break our opponent's posture off the press and drag down, we can now return to two familiar movements and concepts. Moving the foot of the out arm to the shoulder and using a single leg bridge not only reinforces the break in posture, but maintains the shell through the idea of opposite corner control. It may now be possible to pivot to create an angle of attack for a triangle. Similarly, opening the elbow further weakens the structure of the arm set up by the in control. A pivot here creates an optimal angle for a swinging straight leg to pivot and break the posture for a possible omoplata. If your intent is to create a potential angle of attack, don't shrimp. Don't even use that word. Don't hip escape. While various attributes, <coughs> long legs, might get away with a suboptimal angle of attack, too often a hip escape followed by an attempt to pivot creates too much distance and telegraphs the attack while not breaking the posture enough. A guard pass then quickly follows and you look foolish for shrimping. Stupid, stupid shrimping. In submission grappling without the kimono or gi, the in and out control can get slippery to hold on to once someone realizes that it's a threat and tries to squirm free. It is important to use this perceived threat to transition to a longer lasting control. The odds of effective control improve dramatically if you can use two of your limbs to control your opponent's one, with the exception of some configurations where the free limb might punch you in the face. So it is mostly preferred to hand fight towards two-on-one controls. The simplest type of two-on-one grip involves grabbing your opponent's wrists with two of your hands either in a double up or double down position. The double up is kind of like doing a Wu-Tang. You guys remember Wu-Tang, right? It's great for dragging someone over you, while the double down is great for pulling them down to a corner. The double down position will be explored a little bit later on. The double up is most accessible against the kneeler, and is a little bit more difficult to grab when someone is in standing position. Don't be married to a grip. Control in hand fighting is incredibly dynamic and transient, so switch to the next available control or climb to a better one. As you start to lose the in and out, quickly transition to a double up grip. The cross arm will catch the fleeing in arm as your index and thumb will attempt to join at the junction of the wrist and forearm, almost like a bro grip at the wrist. The second hand will then overlap slightly where the index and thumb are supposed to meet at what is often called the gripping zone of weakness. The double up grip is an attempt to close an open circuit, but freakishly big hands or long fingers will actually complete this connection. If you recall, the third principle of guard is to get on top. And you can do this by either creating an angle of attack or, as we'll explore in part two, accomplishing a sweep or takedown. Often from the in and out, an aware opponent will try and withdraw their arm across your body where you can secure a double up grip. By bridging up, you can create tension on the arm and then drag your opponent directly over you by releasing your bridge as well as your feet from the hips. Quickly plant one foot and base on the floor to help you pivot on an angle so that the top player then falls into the open space. If you secure a grip on the lat with your outside arm, you are then able to pin your chest to their shoulder and trap their arm. Build up to base with your free arm acting as a post. Sometimes it's also possible to maintain wrist control at the same time, but don't worry too much about that. Lastly, you can climb up and secure a chest to back connection and pivot further with the near side leg hook across the hip, a la Ryan Hall. And it is optional to then lock in a body triangle. We'll get more into this in unit five. There are many little mistakes that occur with the bridge and drag, including reacting very slowly to the in-arm slipping free, 
and not bothering to secure a new control, dragging them into their base arm on an angle instead of directly overhead, not bridging into the arm, which will result in a weaker drag, and also forgetting to remove your feet from the hips when you drag and just pulling them right into your feet. And last but not least, forgetting to put your foot in base and then struggling to get up or not using your free arm to assist in the process. You got lucky there. I saw that. And now we have the no doubt controversial topic of whether or not closed guard is as overpowering as advertised. As a guard passer, we tend to avoid closed guard like the plague, and we were all taught from day one that it was the place to get to on bottom. And if you sucked at closed guard, well, you were terrible at jujitsu. But maybe this is oversimplified. Maybe closed guard isn't everything. I remember hearing a very unique instructor named Pritt Mickelson first bring this topic to a larger audience. He promoted learning how to play close guard as being more important than closed guard itself. And we at Grapple U tend to agree. And that's why we emphasize the shell guard as a foundation guard system. Don't get me wrong, closed guard has its merits. It is very powerful if you're able to win a grip battle and create an angle of attack. It does very well when an opponent's posture is low with passive arms or they try to back out with a narrow base and dead toes. However, like Pritt, we also discovered that it doesn't fare well against stacking forces, most striking situations, and in the gi, it is often broken open by people standing up, which then places the bottom person in a poor position to recover guard. Simply put, because of the pull-pull nature of closed guard, it can be a bad crutch to develop because it often doesn't teach the newer player to learn how to move or be defensively responsible. It stifles movement, and on top of that, it is very difficult to establish against a good player. Having said that, we don't ban people from using it, but we don't overemphasize its value either. Nevertheless, let's introduce closed guard into our shell system with the classic sweep taught to beginners everywhere. If you recall, there are two paths to getting on top, either creating an angle of attack or accomplishing a sweep or takedown. So here we have the classic flower sweep, which needs a way cooler name. Using the same setup from lesson seven, use the double up grip and overhead drag from the shell guard with that key pivot to create an angle of attack. If you're late to get up or your opponent struggles and keeps you from climbing, you can still secure that strong angle by pulling your knees to your chest and then locking the guard at your ankles around the far hip. Next, secure a gift wrap control by feeding the wrist of the trapped arm to your hand that would have controlled the lat and you can reinforce at the elbow tip if necessary. Now quickly pivot for an underhook of the far leg going elbow deep behind the knee pit. It's very important to then quickly walk in base to create a better angle of attack before using a leg press movement to then complete the sweep. A leg press is just more powerful despite this often being called a pendulum sweep. In addition to shallow grip insertion on the leg, as well as hoping for a pendulum movement and momentum to be enough to topple over a reacting opponent, one of the common mistakes with the flower sweep is becoming too obsessed with hitting the cool move that you ignore the better back attack option, or miss the signs of an overreaction to your flower sweep attempt and then missing, again, the pathway to the back. Don't become too obsessed with technique chasing and learn to read the dynamic changes that occur. Let's take a step back and better understand the psychology of the kneeler. If you remain on your back or in a supine position, the kneeler will often try to force you into a pinned position. If you recall, the kneeler doesn't want to run around or rely on explosive movement. They are often fridge shaped, perhaps not the most gifted athletically, and just want to whittle you down by millimeters. Some common strategies include forcing you into a close quarters control like smash butterfly, over under, or double unders looking for a heavy pressure pass. In order to protect the shell, we need to channel our inner Mr. Miyagi with the proactive use of the wax on wax off leg movement, which is sometimes referred to as egg beatering. This inside out circular movement of the foot clears potential grips, allowing you to re-pummel your legs so that the soles of the feet remain in a leg press position. If you're able to maintain or re-establish a two-on-one control, you can then pummel your legs to stable positions on the opposite side, such as the collarbone, back to the hip, and even the knee. This will keep your opponent guessing and give you multiple options as you half press and sit up or return to your back. A retreating opponent is only a good thing if you continue to track them. Continuing with the double up, as you sense the passer relieving pressure or trying to suddenly back out, use the half press to sit up while still connected. 
kick out their base leg at the opposite corner with a single leg press or push kick at an outward angle of 45 degrees, not straight back. At the same time, pull their arm forward at the opposite 45 degrees. Take advantage of this angle of attack by again putting your foot in base and securing control of your opponent's back. And yes, it is possible to set up again the triangle attack. And just a quick note on gripping. A retreating opponent puts a lot of stress on the structure of your arm. So try and engage your much stronger upper back muscles as much as possible with a rowing pull motion, keeping your elbows as close to your core as possible. As your arms extend too far, your grip will weaken and undoubtedly force you to transition to something else. Now inevitably, even the kneeler might not stay firmly planted on their knees. They'll react in order to protect their own alignment. If the passer raises the opposite side leg into a combat base, push kick out the other knee on an angle. However, against a wrestler's combat base, they have the ability to post with the leg or the arm on the opposite side, so it can be a little bit trickier. Use a sticky foot hook to elevate their leg at the Achilles. If you manage to sufficiently break posture with the accompanying drag, it may be possible to come up on top with a technical stand-up. Note the excellent use of a placeholder and getting the other leg into base being demonstrated. If they stand up fully, well, you're going to have to see part two of unit one. And also note, you can use this dynamic leg positioning with the other two common two-on-one controls we will be exploring in the near future. Grip or hand fighting is an even more dynamic exchange than the battle for the positioning of your legs. It's important to keep in mind that you should fight for the easiest and most powerful two-on-one grip, but take whatever is available. Numerous sequences are possible with many equally valid transitions. Sometimes the initial controlling up grip can't be made and you end up with a single down grip or your standard wrist grip on either side. You might then form a double down grip instead to anchor yourself for the half leg press to sit up. Equally possible is grabbing a collar tie and a single down grip or going from an in control and sliding up to the elbow for the last two on one we will discuss in the next section, the eagle claw. There are no rules of gripping primacy. You keep hunting for a grip that you can secure. You'll see all these sequence variations as we explore the versatile two-on-one control known as the arm drag. The key here is to punch the grip towards their core or between their legs and snatch the back of the triceps above the elbow. This again opens the elbow. Don't try and drag an arm if the hand is still leading. It's just too easy to pummel back in. Also, don't rely on just dragging the person. Actively move yourself as well to secure the angle of attack by gluing your chest to their outside shoulder and securing the lat. Think of the grip as more of an anchor than a propeller. Oh, and remove your foot off the hip when you're about to move, or you'll simply drag them into your foot and they won't go anywhere. Of course, there's always the option of just standing up if they prove too stubborn leaning backwards. The arm drag can also be used against all other types of archetypes, including standing up in a standing battle, sliding up to the armpit after the initial drag makes it an even more powerful movement, but we'll get into that in unit four. Last but not least, we have the Eagle Claw 2 on one grip. It's the last because it's the most difficult to master. It's named after the super lethal traditional kung fu form. It's also named after Eddie Cummings, and Eddie's became synonymous with eagles, and Wolverine Claws look different, so... Yeah, please, please don't hurt me. Eddie Cummings was one of the first to really use this grip successfully in competition. You're probably less likely to use it to its fullest extent in MMA, but it's still a very powerful grip to have in your arsenal. You have the same options of using it with a push kick to take the back or to set up a sneaky triangle. And unlike the double up grip, the claw grip on the elbow brings the omoplata back into play. It also transitions very well into the arm drag. While you can superficially perform an eagle claw control and have it be pretty effective, to get full maximum use out of it, pay attention to the really super anal details. Target the tip of your opponent's elbow right at the dot in the picture, and you're only going to be grabbing with three fingers. Your index and middle finger will try and hook onto a distinct ridge near the bend of the elbow that is likely the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The thumb, meanwhile, just clasps on as best as possible. You will primarily use a hyperextending force directed upwards with this grip, but you can also use it to open the elbow to resist against strong forces. With the other arm, go over the back of their hand and grab a cross wrist grip using your index and thumb right at the joint. Clasp the remaining three fingers over the meat of the thumb and then rotate the whole hand inwards, causing the shoulder to internally rotate. If possible, you can make this even more extreme by rotating your hand all the way so the palm faces you and clutch their hand close to your chest. 
This makes for a very tight control. The Eagle Claw presents you with several options. If transitioning from the in and out, grab a superficial grip at the elbow before dragging the arm across your body to secure the cross wrist grip at your hip. You now have a chance to refine the claw grip. You can then use the half press to sit up to varying degrees depending on the situation. Use a strong row to drag their hand to your pocket. Adding a push kick, an open elbow, or a single leg bridge gives you further options. There's also a sneaky platform armbar, and I highly recommend going to bjjconcepts.net and Rob Bernacki for more in-depth analysis on this grip and its multiple uses. Once in a while, we will demonstrate some gi examples of the general grappling concepts we are exploring during your freshman year. There are so many resources readily available for grappling in the gi that an exhaustive demonstration of every nuance would contribute very little to the overall community. Having said that, the addition of tear-resistant clothing that you can use to both push and pull gives both passer and guard player superpowers. You can essentially affect base, posture, and structure from further away while in the shell guard. The collar punch is very much like a stiff arm to the neck. The collar drag, meanwhile, functions like an arm drag and a collar tie and can be extremely powerful. An overhook with a collar grip is pretty much in and out on steroids. Sleeve and collar control functions in the same way as a two-on-one gripping system. The material of the sleeve allows you to grip with similar force to a two-on-one direct control grip, while the collar grip gives you a collar tie and drag from further away. Together, you can play a very similar system that was previously demonstrated without the gi. An arm drag with even one sleeve grip is possible a la Marcelo Garcia. In fact, one could argue that Marcelo Garcia and Kron Gracie made careers out of playing shell-type guards and these basic controls. Lastly, armpit and sleeve control functions in ways very similar to the Eagle Claw. Like Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Greco-Roman and Freestyle Wrestling, Nogi submission grappling is emerging as a sport unto itself, but with far less recognition of its technical awareness. With its lower cost of entry in terms of equipment, as well as more general applications to both mixed martial arts and self-defense, we can do a lot more for both sports by simply highlighting the adaptations for gi jiu-jitsu. And just to wrap up part one of unit one, here's an example of a full shell guard drill. The guard player is working on using dynamic gripping to control a kneeling passer, since this is meant for the guard player, the passer stays on their knees and merely postures up to test grips and attempts to withdraw their arms. When ready to progress, the passer can offer different combat bases or try and stuff the legs into Smash Butterfly so the bottom player can practice as many foundational skills as possible, including leg pummeling. This will be the last video in part one of unit one, and the whole thing will be available on our channel on YouTube. It's also a nice little vocabulary sheet for you at the end.